Welcome back everyone for today's video we are going to be taking a look at the 10th and final round of the Global Chess League which is being held here in London. Now we have a big matchup between Magnus Carlsen and the Wonderkin from Iran Ali Reza Farouge. It's a very very important matchup as the winner of this match between Ali Reza's team and Magnus's team the Treveni Continental Kings and the Alpine SG Pipers will move on to the finals to play against Peanut Butter and Geary. All right now it might be a bunch of word babble and everything else but it's a very big matchup as the top two teams are playing for a first prize of five hundred thousand dollars all right so let's get into the action Ali Rez is the white piece against Magnus obviously they played this beach chess championship quite recently and we perhaps see a changing of the guard okay game starts with e4 and Magnus decides to play the Sicilian now before we get too deep into the weeds of chess I do want to take a moment to talk about the fact that last night there was a very big poker game featuring myself Magnus Carlson the recent Nobel Prize winner Demis Hassabis Peter Savidler and others which was going on so perhaps Magnus myself and a few others we might be a little bit tired as that game only ended at 3 a.m. this morning and anyway back to the chess we get knight f3 e6 that's a weird time to do it I should have done that in the intro but so be it we get the Sicilian here with d4 take takes and now Magnus plays a6 now this of course is a classic con variation where black goes e6 and a6 very early and now we got the move c4 Magnus plays knight f6 we get knight c3 queen to c7 and here the move a3 is played by Ali Reza now for those of you guys who are following this beach chess championship I actually played the system the con with a6 e6 and queen c7 against Ali Reza I got a very bad position in that game and I would go on to lose so Magnus decides to play the move b6 here we get bishop e3 bishop b7 and now we have the move f3 now white has the classic Moroxy bind structure with the connect three and the pawn on c4 trying to prevent black from playing for the move d5 here we get the move bishop e7 bishop e2 and now Magnus plays the move d6 Ali Reza castles we get castles and now we have the move rook c1 preparing to play on the c file if black should ever play a move like b5 here or if black goes d5 and the c file opens up this way as well so we get knight bd7 Ali Reza plays b4 we get rook c8 and here we have the move queen d2 Magnus plays rook e8 we get knight b3 and now we have the move queen b8 now at this point white has a lot more space in the center of the board you have these nice pawns that restrict black from ever pushing the knights are also keeping an eye on these squares as well and white can even put the rook on d1 now one of the things with the hedgehog structures is that black almost always needs to play d5 or b5 at some point because white controls so much more space in the center of the board so we get rook fd1 Magnus plays h5 here and now we get the move bishop f4 and we have the move knight e5 now bishop f4 is already stepping in a direction that I don't like I actually thought that if Ali Reza were to play with like bishop f1 say we get bishop f8 and queen f2 due to the pressure on the diagonals here I think white is still a little bit better but it's all going to come down to whether black can play for this d5 pawn break or not instead we get the move bishop f4 knight e5 is played to stop white from winning this pawn here on d6 and black also now targets the pawn on c4 Ali Reza plays knight a4 and now we get the move bishop c6 and here the move knight b2 is played now this is already a step in the wrong direction here with knight a4 what Ali Reza probably should have played was the move queen d4 pressuring the pawn on b6 but this is a very difficult move to play here because now you walk into all kinds of things like knight takes f3 and maybe an e5 which forks the queen and the bishop here maybe knight c4 followed by e5 could be very dangerous and at any rate you have to spend quite a bit of time Ali Reza of course plays knight a4 instead we get bishop c6 knight b2 what he's trying to do here is not get too far down on the clock because if he gets low on time with the zero second increment he will simply lose so Magnus goes h4 we get queen to e3 and now Ali Reza plays knight g6 and here we get the move bishop g5 trying to put pressure on the diagonal as well as the pawn on h4 Magnus plays b5 and now we get the move knight to d4 and this is a very very tough spot to be in for Ali Reza because the computer actually is giving black a bit of an advantage black has achieved b5 black can now play for e5 or d5 and considering the time situation it's very very hard because black's moves here should be generally a reaction to what white does for example if white takes on b5 black will simply recapture and push the ball back into white's court where white has to come up with an idea say white plays a move like takes 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 and bishop f1 now black can even play a move like knight to h5 or trade the rooks here or play for d5 and generally speaking here black does not have a lot of plans to consider whereas Ali Reza has to find something concrete so considering the time situation considering the ease with which Magnus can play moves or find the idea it's a very dicey spot for Ali Reza to be in 
So we get h3 played here. Magnus now plays d5, a very thematic move, trying to open up the center of the board. He's hoping to even open up the classic e-file for the tower on e8 with all these fossils in play. Ali Reza decides to play c5, and now we get the move e5 being played. Now, the computer actually wants to move queen g3, but frankly, this is a very tough move to play here because white can play a move like c6, and it's, it looks like it's uh oh, spaghetti -o time as your bishop is simply trapped, but after e5, apparently black is better. Now, again, remember this is a blitz game, no increment. You have to try and make some practical decisions. You cannot look to play the best move. And that's, that's why Magnus plays e5 instead, attacking the horse on d4, but also opening up scope for the b, so it will never get trapped by the pawn push. Ali Reza goes knight to f5, and now Magnus trades and goes for knight to f4. Now, what you'll notice here is that the pawns on the king side are very much glued here. If white takes on f4 after takes, queen f2 and knight h5, suddenly the knight is jumping to g3, the bishop is coming to f6, and you have an open e-file to use as well. So white is actually in quite a bit of trouble here, despite having a pass pawn that he can push up the c-file. So... Ali Reza goes bishop takes pawn on h4, and now Magnus plays move knight g4, creating a temporary fossil here where the knight hits the queen and the bishop attacks the bishop on h4. Ali Reza takes, and now after bishop takes h4, white is actually up one pawn here. You'll notice 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Black is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. But the problem here is black has a knife on f4, hitting the pawn and the bishop. And additionally, you also have a big black center with the pawns on d5 and e5. So, Ali Reza goes knight d3, Magnus plays d4, we get queen e4, and here we have the move knight takes bishop. Ali Reza takes, and now we get e4, and at this point, Magnus is simply pushing his p. Ali Reza is in a lot of trouble here. These two pawns, this big black center, are massing, and white is actually completely lost at this point in the game. On top of that, Magnus is also at five minutes on the clock here. Remember, Magnus Carlsen did get a winning position against Ali Reza in their first encounter, but he did lose on time. So all roads are look all roads look like they're leading to Rome here for Magnus. Can Ali Reza defend? One thing I would say about Ali Reza is he is clearly the best player at playing when he has no time on the clock. So we get knight of two. Magnus plays queen f4 here, guarding the pawn on e4 and intending to either take the knight on f2 or push d3 and e3 as well. Here the game continues with rook f1, and now we get to move queen to e5. Ali Reza plays rook e1, and here we get to move queen d5. Now Magnus is simply setting his piece up on better squares before deciding which pawn to push forward. Ali Reza plays g5, and now we get this move queen takes f5. Now this is actually a big mistake from Magnus, because at this point, if he simply pushes p with d3, queen e3, d2, rook d1, and now rook d8, black is actually close to winning here. You're probably going to wait, white can go g3, right? Bishop is simply trapped. Queen guards both juicers, and of course, it is a classic 90-degree right triangle. However, after g3, black can sack the bishop, and after takes e3, knight g4, you do not push e2 here, because there's knight f6 creating the classic family fork. So instead, you play queen d4, stopping knight f6, and now after f6 and e2 check, king has to go to, say, h2, and very importantly, you can under-promote here by taking the rook and making a horse to check the king, and now after rook takes f1, you have rook e2 check, king h1, and after queen e4, king g1, queen g2, this would be a checkmate. Now, the great thing about this position is that Magnus has a lot of time here in, at this moment, but he starts to spend his time and he does not find the killer blow and he ends up playing queen takes pawn. Now, after queen to h5, black is still better here, but the big issue is that you are not going to be able to escort both of these pawns up the board and win the game cleanly. So, Magnus goes queen h7, we get queen g4 here. This is also a mistake, by the way. After takes, takes in this position, rook to e2. Black, if he pushes a pawn, white gets a blockade. And apparently, rook d8 and black still better. But it's a very tough spot to be in here. And considering the low time, I'm not sure if Magnus would have found this continuation with rook to d8, sacking the juicer on e4. Instead, we get queen g4. Magnus plays e3. Now the knight on f2 is under attack. But Ali Reza can go g3. Here we get the move pawn takes knight, and this is apparently a huge mistake after which white is not even losing anymore. Now, according to the computer, black is supposed to sack the bishop here, and after queen takes bishop, you do not take the horse, but instead you go e2, trapping the rook on f1, and now you win one of the rooks, and you win the game. Now, is this easy to find? No, and actually an important point to note is that Magnus here is up two minutes on the clock, so the world is his oyster, 
but he starts trying to play on time. And this is one of the things that I said before about Ali Reza, which is that when he gets low on time, he is better at defending and finding good moves for whatever reason than anybody else in the world. It is not even close. So Magnus takes, we get King takes pawn, Magnus checks, and after King G1, now Magnus will lose his extra bishop on the rim, and he only has one pass pawn to push up the board on the D file, and at this point, it's a question of can Magnus really, really buckle down and press Ali Reza on both the board and the clock without making a blunder. So Magnus takes, we got queen takes, 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 and now we have the move d3. And here, Ali Reza plays the move queen f5. Now this move is apparently a blunder. Queen d5 would have been better because after d2 and rook f1, you pressure the pawn on f7 while stopping the d-pawn from moving to the end of the board and becoming a queen. Instead, we get queen f5, the queen hits the rook, and now if black were to push, you could also maybe consider the Botez gambit as well. Magnus goes rook f8, we get to move rook to f1, and here we have the move queen c3. Ali Reza goes queen d5, we get queen takes pawn, and now we get to move c6. Now, amazingly in this position, white could force a draw by sacking the rook with rook takes pawn, because after takes, check, if you go up, there's simply queen h4, and after check, check, king here, there's check, and then queen f4 with the yo-yo. And if you were to play rook to f8, now I check on d5. And if you go over, I just start checking on h5 and d5. And the game will end in a draw. Now, with more time on his clock, Ali Reza probably could find this move. But with 19 seconds and no increment, he just has to move and try to avoid blundering. So we get the move c6. Magnus takes. We got c7. And now we have the move queen c4. Ali Reza goes queen d7, guarding the pawn and maybe threatening to take on f7 as well. Magnus plays d2, we get rook d1, and here the move queen c5 check is played. Now this is another mistake from Magnus at this point. Apparently queen c1 would be winning because if white were to take with the queen, now you take this juicer, and black simply has two extra pawns on the king side, and will win the game. Instead we get queen c5. Now after king g2, Magnus plays move g6. If he were to go queen c1 here, white can take with the rook, as there is no pin on the back rank anymore, and now white is not even worse. Magnus goes g6, Ali Reza takes, we get king g7, and now we have the move queen d8. Queen d8. Now you'll notice, Ali Reza has 12 seconds to Magnus's 1 minute and 15 seconds. If there were increment, Ali Reza would not lose this position, but with no increment, it's a question of whether he can trade off enough material and make the draw. We get queen c6, Ali Reza goes king h2, we get rook e8, and now we have the move h4 being played. Magnus plays b4, and now we get h5, and here the move b3 is played. Now, at this point, Ali Reza is apparently winning the game if he were to play queen d4 check, because after king to h7 and queen f4, you hit the pawn on f7, and after king g7, I think there's some h6 here with maybe some kind of weird lolly mate. Maybe I'm wrong. I think queen d4 is correct, and with this lolly mate on g7 looming, apparently white is winning. But no time here for Ali Reza. He's just got to move, and so he plays the move rook f2. Magnus takes on h5. We get queen g5, queen g6, and now the move queen d8 is played. Magnus goes queen e6, we get check, king f8, and now the move queen c5 check. King g8, queen g5, queen g6, and now queen d8. Now at this point, the game would be a draw if there was increment 100%, but Magnus here wants to get revenge for the game he lost on time to Ali Reza, and you know he's going to do whatever it takes to get the flag. So he goes queen e6, queen g5, king h8, rook f6, and now we get the move queen e2. Ali Reza goes king g1, we get queen d1, rook f1, and now we get the move queen d4. Ali Reza plays rook f2, we get rook e1, and now we have the move king g2, and after queen to e4, Ali Reza plays rook f3. Now notice how Magnus is down to 14 seconds, but with only 2 seconds on the clocker, Ali Reza does not have enough time to survive, and after rook to e2 check, we get king h3, queen e6, and here Ali Reza plays the move g4, after which he is a little bit worse and will lose on time. Now if Ali Reza were to play the move rook f5, blocking the check here, after rook c2 takes king g8, queen g5, again with all these yo yo's in play white will not lose so we get g4 magnus now plays move pawn takes pawn and here we get the move king g3 ali Reza is still apparently okay after queen takes pawn because if black goes for the flash tactic with rook h2 after takes queen g4 rook to h3 check suddenly when you move the king there's rook to g3 here winning the queen on g4 after takes takes b2 queen not knight sorry after queen queen and queen a6 game also probably ends in a draw but it goes on 
Instead, we get King G3, Magnus takes, we get Queen H5, King G7, and after Queen G5, King F8, Queen D8, King G7, Ali Reza Ferugia flags on the clock here, and Magnus Carlsen gets the big dub. Now, one of the amazing things that I've hinted at many times in this video, but I even spoke about during the SEC, is look at how low on time Ali Reza got in this game, and still, with no time on the clock, he played incredibly precise chess. On some, to some degree, you could argue he played better with no time than he did when he actually had time to think, and this really speaks to how strong Ali Reza is and why in the regular formats with increment, Ali Reza is a huge threat to potentially win the World Blitz or the World Rapid Championship. So, Magnus gets his revenge. He wins on time. He flags Ali Reza in return for what happened in the first game. Unfortunately for Magnus Carlsen, in spite of his win against Ali Reza in this game, Ali Reza's team, the Treveni Continental Kings, would beat Magnus's team, meaning that in the grand final tomorrow, it will be Peanut Butter and Geary playing against Ali Reza's team, and Magnus's team gets shut out. They will not compete for the grand prize of $500,000, and Magnus will not get the win in this big team event. So, this game ends in a victory for Magnus. Unfortunately, his team doesn't make it. And now we're going to take a look at my final game of this event where I'm playing with the white pieces against none other than Anish Geary. So, in this match, there's not a lot at stake. My team is guaranteed to finish in fourth place. I'll not Ali Reza, Anisha's team is guaranteed to probably finish in first place. They're going to make the finals no matter what. Our result or our position will not change. So at this point, we're simply playing chess to have fun. So I open with B3 once again, like I did against Magnus a couple of days ago. At any rate, it seems like a reasonable choice because if it's good enough for the five-time world champion, why is it not good enough to play against Geary? So on each goes knight f6. I play bishop b2, and now we get to move c5. Now, one funny thing unbeknownst to me is that my teammate on board two, Jan Christoph Duda, also opened in his game with b3 and bishop b2 against Noderbeck. Noderbeck would play b6 and go for the mirror fianchito on the queen side here. But in my game, we get to move c5. I play e3, knight c6, knight f3, and now on each plays g6 to fianchito as bishop on g7 and oppose my fianchito to bishop on b2. I go g3 here, trying to go for the double fianchito, and now we get bishop g7, bishop g2, castles, castles, d5, and here I play the move knight to e5, trying to open up the scopes for both of these b's. On each trades, and now he goes bishop g4, I play queen c1, and here we get the move queen d7. Here I play d3, intending to put my knight on d2, and Anish goes bishop h3, trading off the light square b's. I play knight d2, we get takes, takes, and now we have the move knight h5 being played. Now at this point, it's very clear to me that Anish simply wants to simplify into an endgame, get as many pieces off the board, and follow up his nickname, Anish, or not Anish, sorry, Dranish Giri. So I trade, I go knight f3, and now Anish plays rook c8, and here I go c4 with the idea of trying to maybe play on the c file, maybe bring my rooks to the center of the board, and simply keep the game going. Anish plays b5, I go rook d1, we get rook fd8, and here I play the move a4 after a bit of a think. Now, I wanted to maybe consider taking this pawn, but after takes, e4, queen b7, queen e3, and knight e6, black has a queen on a nice diagonal here. There's pressure towards the pawn on d3. The knight maybe is jumping to d4, and structurally, it feels like black should be better. So the other idea I thought was maybe I can take on b5, create a bit of an imbalance with maybe like queen c2 and rook c1 here. But I think after f6, rook c1 and e5, now there's a classic big black center here. It's also a snake of a chain, and black is doing very well. So ultimately, I play a4, and now Dranish Giri, true to his nickname, decides to start trading off a bunch of pieces here, and we reach an endgame after knight e6. Now, at this point, I thought I might be slightly better due to this weak pawn on c5 in the long run, combined with my control of the open d5. But alas, the big issue I have is that this pawn on a4 is too far up the board. If I could magically put this pawn back on a2, maybe I would be okay. But the pawn on a4, this pawn on b3 is a big weakness, and unfortunately, the game is very close to being a draw. So I go h4, we get h5, I play rook d3, and Anish plays rook b8 here, putting pressure on the pawn on b3. Now I go e4, trying to break the pin on the diagonal, and Anish plays move queen c7. Here I go rook c3, and now we get to move queen d6. Important to note that if Anish plays rook b4, trying to create the kebab on the fourth rank, where this rook targets everything here in this position, I will probably sack the queen, and after takes, takes, and knight d4, if anybody is better, it's white, as I'm going to get the octopus horse, which will fork all of these pawns at the same time. So, Anish plays the move 
queen d6, I go queen d5, we get king g7, and here I decide to trade the queens on d6 and play rook d3. Now, when I traded the queens, I thought maybe I could play knight e5 and be better, but after rook d8, I simply didn't see anything better than trading the queens anyway, so I decide to go for this exchange and play rook d3, hitting the pawn. On each plays rook b6, guarding the pawn on d6 from being captured and pressuring the pawn on b3. Here I go knight d2, we get knight d4, knight c4, and now we get a big exchange here where all the all the rooks come off the board and we're in a classic knight and pawn endgame. Now here on each plays king f6, and now I play the move knight c4, and we get the move knight d4. Apparently after king to f3, maybe I'm very slightly better, but honestly I was kind of worried that after king e5 takes and king d4, black is suddenly pushing p on the c file here, and it could get very dangerous in a hurry. So I play knight c4. Now the black king cannot enter. If the king goes to e6, you'll notice that both of these critical central squares here are covered and the king cannot get in. And even if black were magically able to bring the king all the way over to the queen side, you'll notice here that even if the king gets to a6, there is still no entry here. The b5 and a5 squares are covered as well. So the knight and the two pawns cover all these critical central squares and the black king simply never has an entry. So we get knight d4, I play f3, king e6, king f2, we get f6, king e3, and now Anish plays knight c2, check. Here I go king d3, knight b4, king c3, and we get this move f5. Now this move is a very, very precise move, because if Anish were to play knight c6, now after f4, knight to d4, and king d3, followed by knight to d2 and king c4, I think there are some chances I could maybe be a little bit better, but when Anish goes f5 here, at this point, I really don't have a choice but to trade the pawns. If I move my knight away, black will trade, and suddenly the king is starting to enter here in the center of the board, and it's very scary. And if I were to play a move like uh, e5, for example, now after f4 takes knight d5, king d2, knight f4, there's threats of king d5, there are threats of knight g2, and all of my pawns here in the center of the board are very, very weak. So I decide to take on each takes, and now I go knight d2, we get king d5 here, black trying to stop my king from getting in, and here I play the move knight f1. On each goes king c6, and now I make a very committal decision to play this move g4. This is really a last gasp effort to try and create something complicated on the board. I could have also played knight h2, but after knight d5, king c4, there's knight f6 stopping the pawn thrust, there's knight b6 forking the king of the pawn, and I simply never will be able to play g4 and create the pass pawn on the h file. So, after king c6 here, I decide to play the move g4, sacking a pawn here, but in return, now I have an outside juicer. I'm trying to push my p and win the game. However, Anish is able to check and go knight f6 here, and after h6 and a6, the knight is stopping the pawn, and even though I have this past h pawn, unfortunately, I'm down a pawn here, so it's not possible to win any of these three pawns, and the game simply ends in a draw very soon. I go a5, knight h7, knight g3, and after king d6, I have to make a repetition with knight f1. I'd love to go check, but after king e5 takes and g3, now black's pass pawn is getting up the board. It's still probably a draw after check, and knight to e1, king e3, king c5, but at the end of the day, there's no reason to go into this because if anybody is going to be winning, it's black if I have miscalculated up square for the horse. So I play knight f1, on each goes king c6, and now the game ends by repetition here with knight f1 and knight g3. Neither side can actually do anything. Say black were to go knight g5, this would lose the game here. Or actually, I should say, in this position, if black were to play knight f6, this is a little bit scary because after knight e4, not knight e4, sorry, knight h5, maybe you go back and it's still a draw, but there are chances to go wrong. And I think Anish and I both know the game will end in a draw at this point, so there's no reason to continue. So the game ends in a draw. What does this mean? This means that for my team, we finish in fourth place, the American Gambits. For me overall, it's a pretty successful event. I win three games, I lose one, and I have six draws along the way. I gain something like 10 rapid points, which rapid rating doesn't really matter all that much, but certainly it's been a very long time since I've had a good result in rapid chess, so I feel pretty good about how I did. Uh, for Anish, he had a pretty good result as well, but I think for him, what what happens tomorrow will determine how he feels because of his team, the Peanut Butter and Geary Alaska Knights win their match. They will get $500,000, which would be huge. If they lose, probably he won't be feeling as good. But at any rate, Anish has had a good result. His team has had a good result. For me, I'm pretty happy as well because, again, there is no I in team. And even though I played well, unfortunately, some critical matches, some other team members struggled, and that is just how team events go. And I don't even really fault them. Everybody gave their best effort, but it wasn't meant to be. So tomorrow, there's a grand final between Anish 
Anisha's team and Ali Reza's team for $500,000. Should be pretty exciting. I may or may not do a recap because as most of you know, the United States Chess Championship has also started today. I'll probably be doing a recap in a couple of hours of a big game between Fabiano and Hans Neiman. So you probably stay tuned for that. But at any rate, I hope you guys have enjoyed my recaps from the Global Chess League. If you're not already subscribed to the channel, make sure that you smash that subscribe button below and we'll be back with some more recaps in the very, very near future, probably within a few hours. Hope you guys enjoyed. Have a great rest of your morning, afternoon, evening, and I'll see you very soon. Bye.